Hi, Brian Whiten's filling in for Buck Lavasser. Welcome to Discovering. Well, the sap is running, and we're back at Bernie Sugarbush for part two of Making Maple Syrup. But first, we'll visit a Delta County artist who's busy turning wood into wildlife. And it's fun to watch the people's eyes because they can't believe it's just a single piece of wood. And I was in Marquette recently for the 20th annual Boat, Sport and RV show at the Superior Dome. From there, it was right around the corner for Dan Keating's Salmon School. I had the chance to talk with Dan after his seminar. A lot of people don't realize the tremendous resource that we have in all the Great Lakes. So sit back, put your feet up and come on along. It's Monday night and time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf. Lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. I've always been amazed and inspired by someone who can look through the lens of a camera at a leaf and see something that has nothing to do with a leaf. Or look at a log and see a family of bears. Or in this case, look at a block of wood and see a family of wolves beside a pool of water. Daryl Thurston is just such an artist. I had the opportunity to visit with Daryl at his shop in Delta County. Well, I'm going to demonstrate as to how to carve a hummingbird. This is a piece of cedar. I always keep the, the cedar wet or green and what I'm going to do first of all is I'm just going to round the tail off and then I'm going to cover it down a little bit so we have a little bit of structure on the back of the head. So we're just going to drop this down a little bit and then we're going to start bringing the beak out. And I've been carving these for, oh heck, 20 years. Uh, I watched a gentleman up at the Hiawatha Music Festival carve one one time. And I've been carving them ever since, and then I've finally done my own design. So now what we're going to do is we're going to design the wing. So we're going to come back here at a slight bit of an angle, make a couple marks, and then we'll cut it deeper so that we create a stop cut. So when I come back in to make the, the wing design, it's, it's going to stop right in the bottom of that, that cut. Now you can design the wing, you know, about any way you want to. I've found that this is the best because when they interlock, then they stay put. So once we get this side carved, in order to be the same on the other side, I just simply roll a knife across, make a mark, roll it across, and turn it over and do the same thing. And then I just line up those marks and there's my cut on the other side. And again, I come back and I make some stop cuts. Now the front portion of this wing has to be quite narrow. The back side doesn't have to be as narrow because that's, that doesn't have any stretch to it. Now the, the cedar should either be a straight grained cedar across this way or straight as possible, or it can be vertical this way. And the reason for that is because if, if you go to, uh, when you go to cut the feather lengthwise, a lot of times it'll want to split with the grain. So if you get a nice straight grain cedar, then uh, it won't try to follow the grain, it'll, it'll split equally. Okay, now that we've got this pretty much taken care of as far as designing the wing, we're going to go back and finish the front of the body and the beak, and then we'll come back and we'll split them. Well, 
when I'm carving, a power carving, uh, of course I use the Dremels and I have the, the Fordhams and the, yeah, the NSKs and also I have the burner, uh, which I burn all the hair and everything on the animals that I create. And this is a grinding uh, bit that I use on a lot of my carvings. When you're doing animals and stuff like that, you almost have to have power tools because doing them all by hand can't get the good texture into the animal, into the hair, uh, into the design, because everything I try to do as a carver is create a, a realistically looking animal. Trying to do an antler with a jackknife, even one of my carving knives, is just virtually impossible because they're so brittle. I've been carving now for about 25 years. I've done a lot of animal carvings and I've studied under Kurt Curtis, which is a world-renowned wildlife artist. If you really want to get into some, some nice carvings, the best thing to do, of course, is to get in with, a, with an instructor that knows the muscle structure, the anatomy, uh, the hair flows, uh, and then once you get into doing these over a period of time, then it's real simple as far as, I shouldn't say simple, but at least you know what you got to do as far as your hair flow, your muscle structures, and your anatomy. Okay, we're going to stop right there and go to a different style knife. This is what they call an eye knife or a detail knife. And I use these for, for doing real fine detail work around the eyes, the ears, the nose, and also splitting the feathers. Okay, now we're, as we're splitting these wings, it doesn't make any difference how many there are. It's always going to, we'll end up with an uneven number uh, simply because we need a center feather for the tail to flare up, off from. All right, now we got all the tail feathers split. We're going to go back and finish up the body. So there's a basic design of the hummingbird. Now what we'll do is we'll flare the feathers out. So you just grab a hold of a feather and give it a twist. Next one goes the opposite direction. Then you just keep going back and forth and then you lock the feathers together so that they'll stay in place. You know, even as a kid, when I was in uh, Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, you know, I was kind of interested in carving, but really never got into it until about 25 years ago. I was at uh, a music concert up at Marquette at the Hiawatha Music Festival, and I watched a gentleman carve the hummingbird. And I thought, well, you know, I, I really want to try that. So I've been carving on the hummingbird ever since. And then I, I joined uh, the Bajanak Chiselers uh, here in Escanaba uh, years ago. And uh, I've been carving ever since. You know, I've, I've done a lot of studying under Kirk Curtis and under uh, Harry Winslow and, and uh, Stu Martin. Uh, I've been out to Doan College and carved out there. Uh, so there's just all kinds of things that you can do with these. You know, you're just, your mind is what you're going to uh, carry on, I guess. And now this week's UP Outdoor Calendar. The DNR's Fisheries Division will hold public meetings to discuss local fisheries management and regulation proposals. The meetings will take place Tuesday, April 2nd from 7 to 9 Eastern at the Ishpeming Township Hall. Wednesday, April 3rd from 6 to 8 Central Time at Gogebic Community College in Ironwood. And Thursday, April 4th from 7 to 9 Eastern at the Portage Lake District Library in Houghton. Meetings will also be held the following week in Escanaba, Air Mountain, Munising, and Newberry. On April 6th, it's the Uphill Drags at Marquette Mountain. And don't forget, your 2012 fishing license expired yesterday. If there's something outdoor-related happening in your area that you'd like folks to know about, let us know by visiting us at realoutdoorsup.com. This past weekend marked the 20th year for the UP Boat, Sport, and RV show held at the Superior Dome in Marquette. It was a great opportunity to check out the latest outdoor equipment on the market. I spent some time browsing the show myself. Well, this, this will be the 20th year of the Boat, Sport, and RV show. And every year we've been in the dome here. Uh, the nice thing about the dome, it's a roomy, comfortable atmosphere to come and look at things. Uh, we have a 101,000 square feet of exhi exhibit space in the center of the dome, which is full of boats, RVs, ATVs, bicycles, canoes, kayaks. Uh, we've got it all covered. You can have a, a quiet sport like a canoe or a kayak or a bicycle, or you can have a motorbike or a four-wheeler or a or whatever your pleasure is in a motorized vehicle. We have been anywhere uh, between seven and 10,000. Uh, the average is lately has been between seven and 8,000, um, which if you consider the size of the Upper Peninsula, that's a fairly good number. We only have 300,000 people in the whole UP. We tend to draw from throughout the Upper Peninsula. Uh, we get people from uh, all the way from Ironwood to Sault Ste. Marie coming to the show. 
It's a very good place to come if you're looking to buy something. You can comparison shop as far as price, quality, and style because you have the most of the dealers from the Upper Peninsula are in here, and it saves you all the time and trouble of running around searching them out. And all the product is side by side, and hopefully you can get your best deal with somebody by comparison shopping and pricing. That works out pretty good for a lot of people. Some of the buyers wait for the show to get their boat or pontoon or bike or uh, canoe or kayak or whatever their pleasure is. The majority are from the Upper Peninsula, but we do have some from northern Wisconsin and we have some people from lower Michigan. So we have a good cross-section of material uh, and a widespread variety of product. It's a good place if you want to come in and see what's new. You know, a lot of times there's new product and they'll have the new things on display and you can see how things work and ask questions from the vendors as to how things are going to work with a new product. Last year, for example, we had stand-up paddle boards were a hot item. Now they have them everywhere, but for a while it was a brand new item. We're always in March. Uh, basically, uh, that's the time the dome is available to us. And plus it's kind of a nice kickoff for the spring and summer season. This year was a real treat with the weather for moving in, but that's just part of being in the Upper Peninsula. <laughs> just, just the way it works up here. Last year, uh, this time, it was, you know, excessive temperatures for the uh, time, and this year, it's, they're below normal, so. I guess it all averages out. Don't miss the Wood Tick Music Festival in Hermansville, Michigan. Four days of great bluegrass, country, folk, blues, and rock and roll. Over 25 bands, fun for the entire family. Carry-ins welcome kids 12 and under free. Buy your tickets and campsites and find out everything you need to know online at woodtickfestival.com. That's woodtickfestival.com. The Wood Tick Music Festival in Hermansville, Michigan. Just around the corner from the Superior Dome is Lakeview Arena, where Dan Keating, one of the Great Lakes most renowned salmon fishermen, was holding a salmon school sponsored by Daybreak Charters and the South Shore Fishing Association. I had the opportunity to talk with Dan for a bit after the seminar. My name is Dan Keating, and we just have spent uh, today up here talking salmon with over 100 guys who were hardcore salmon enthusiasts. Uh, John at Daybreak Charters set up the seminar. It was a great turnout. Um, and this was my first trip to the UP, my first time seeing Lake Superior, and we had a great time. And a lot of people don't realize the tremendous resource that we have in all the Great Lakes, uh, Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, uh, Lake Huron, Lake Ontario. There's just a world-class salmon and trout fishery. And so we were talking today, we, we had guys that had driven from as much as four hours away that came to talk about how to catch salmon and trout. We covered uh, currents, how the water moves around in the Great Lakes talked about how to find the fish. Uh, specifically, we focused more on king salmon and steelhead because those are the most exciting fish to catch, and the kings get big. Um, we talked about some of the tactics and techniques we use for presenting our lures to them. We talked about lure selection, and you know, today it's just, it's just really amazing how many different lures there are, and you, you know, we could have spent a couple days talking about all the different spoons, the flashers and flies, and all the different things that we use to catch the fish. Talked a bit about water temperature, a little bit of, about electronics. And it was, really, it was really fun to see that we had so many different guys up here that were really enthusiastic. Um, it's obvious that they're passionate about fishing out on big water and chasing salmon and trout. And our season, once the ice uh, leaves the harbors and the bays and the shoreline, our season will get going. And we start fishing typically in April, and the season runs through the summer into the fall. And every harbor is a little different as far as what fish you can catch where. And some of what we talked about today was how to, um, how to listen to the lake, how to listen to the fish. I've been chartering for over 30 years, giving seminars all across the Great Lakes region. And one of the things, while it's great to have a hot lure, it's great to have a, a tip on where to go to fish, one of the things that I try to do is teach people on how to think uh, when they're out in the water, how to read the water, how to factor in environmental factors, weather changes, currents, so they can make educated, wise decisions on the water and adapt to the fish. Um, also, we do have a number of resources. Um, you can get all these on Amazon. Uh, we've got a, three books, 
and a couple DVDs, which really um, take over 30 years of experience, uh, time on the water, and talk a lot about some of the different things as far as different tactics, different techniques for locating salmon and trout, and, and how to find them. And uh, over the last few years, our fishing on, on Lake Michigan has been some of the best fishing we've ever had in terms of both numbers of fish and we catch a lot of really nice sized fish. Another thing about salmon and trout fishing is they are great dinner guests to invite home for dinner. Um, so another thing that people don't realize is that multi-species fishermen, you can get into salmon and trout fishing. You don't have to have a 30 foot boat. If you pick your weather, pick the right day. Um, you know, there's a lot of, whether it's these books or there's other great information out there online, you can get a selection of tackle and you can venture out on the water and start chasing these salmon and trout. At times of the year, these fish come in really close to shore and there's a learning curve to this. Once you figure a few things out, your catch rate will really improve and it's a lot of fun. So again, we just want to say thank you to John and Daybreak Charters for hosting this event and setting it up. Uh, hope everyone has a great season. Thank you. It's time for the Discovering Tip of the Week. Springtime is just around the corner, we hope. And to Great Lakes fishermen, that means salmon. Here's a tip from Captain Dan Keating about using light gear. There's a real misconception on fishing the Great Lakes. People think about big water, they think, wow, big water, I need a big boat, and I need to spend tons of money. Nothing could be further from the truth. Actually, one of my favorite rods to catch fish on out there is this little uh, Akuma Clarion reel, and it's loaded with about 300 yards of 12-pound line, and you can see here, this is a bass rod. This tiny little rod, is, it's, a, it's a hoot to catch a big king on this little rod. And one reason this rig works so well is because we're running clean spoons and we'll run body baits on it sometimes, but salmon and trout seems like they like this spoon. And we're running a real small swivel on there. You can see that's a uh, 30 pound Sampo Coast Lock swivel. It's silver, uh, I think that makes a difference. It's a real small swivel with a 12 pound line. This little swivel on here, it's ball bearing, so the spoon won't twist your line up, and it's very lightweight. If you put a big swivel on this spoon, it'll tend to weight the nose of the spoon down and inhibits the trolling action. And we talked a lot about on how to run this rig, and you can run a rig like this for salmon and trout. You can run it when you're trolling for walleyes. Um, but we're stretching these back typically off a downrigger anywhere from 30 to 200 feet, kind of letting the fish uh, tell us where to set it. <laughs> Well, the weather's finally warmed up a bit and the maples have begun to give up their sugar water. I headed back out to Bernie's camp for part two of making maple syrup. It's time to pick up the sap. Bad, but a half a pail. Got to try to keep the rain and the snow and stuff out of that. So the little buckets that we we made, so we can. Keep the rain out. It ain't very fancy, but it works. Now that we picked about oh about 50 gallons, and we even we didn't pick all the pails because we had to wait. We got kind of late, so uh, and this is the way we do it. It's uh, probably old-fashioned and slow, but. That's, uh, you know, we don't have the modern equipment. Uh, we fill up all the cans like this, and then we uh, go up to the sugar shack there, and uh, we got a little motor. We put the hose in here and dump it all into the big tank, you know, milk strainer that we got.
and sheet of dirt and all that, that that's on it. We burn them. After we start a fire, we start burning them. That's what we do. And well, that's the way we pick up the sap going through the woods all over. So now we're going to switch over to the four-wheeler and go down the road. That's, we got a bunch of pails down the road. So that's what we're going to do now. This is the first picking, so I imagine it'll be, oh, probably 30, 35 gallons to one. It'll be worthwhile. Usually the first run is usually, you get the, the, the better syrup and everything, especially the first two, three pickings. After that, it might slow down quite a bit. Be careful for the ice, fellas. Take a little more boiling. Use a little bit more wood. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's supposed to be nice for the next three, four days, and I hope that we can get it running real good. Like at this time, there's, there's lots of ice in these buckets right now. We'll probably be throwing a whole lot of it out, but I guess what you're supposed to do is raise it up and, and let it uh, drip as much as it can off of there, and then just throw it away because it's mostly water anyway. Uh, you, it, it's just gonna prolong your, your, your boiling if you put it, you know, with the sap. So, and there's no use, you want to get it done as quick as you can. We've got them all emptied now, and today is Thursday. Tomorrow we'll have to pick again. The way, because this is the first running, you know, and I, I'm pretty sure we'll have to pick again Friday, in the afternoon especially. Ah, uh, yeah, we'll be boiling. Maybe Saturday, I don't know. And we might wait till Monday, uh, all depends. Well, that's all for tonight. Join us next week for the final segment of Making Maple Syrup. And I'll be venturing into the Hiawatha for some ice fishing by Dog Sled. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week right here on Discovering.